Hey guys, how's it going? It's me, Josh Halter, owner and founder of The Bio Dude. You can come visit me here at The Bio Dude Houston, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., Saturdays, 10 a.m., 2 p.m. Visit my website, thebiodude.com. Check me out on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, you know, the whole nine yards. Got a pretty cool video today ahead of us here. I'm Mariah Healy, owner of Reptifiles. Uh, main website is reptifiles.com, also present on Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, so today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how naturalistic setups, you know, bioactive, you know, fully functional ecosystems can help bring out the different levels of intelligence that, you know, our pet reptiles and amphibians have. Uh, you know, we, we're going to briefly talk about how that level of intelligence can be measured um, and, and the aspect of how we should be looking at it to know that we as keepers are nurturing the, those positive things that we want to bring out in the terrariums, as well touch base a little bit about impaction. We know that there's a big thing in the hobby about, you know, losing, using loose substrate and, you know, bioactive and causing impaction of reptiles and amphibians. And Mariah, you know, we are not veterinarians, but we do have extensive experience with this matter. And we just kind of wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about what causes impaction and, you know, some of the things behind it that we can almost prevent it, you know, in the hobby almost entirely, I feel mm -hmm. it could be with the proper information channels that we have. So yeah. the first thing, you know, that I really wanted to talk about in regards to like the animal intelligence is, you know, you know, we really want to learn about how exactly do you measure an animal's intelligence? Because when people think of intelligence, they think of a human. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, if the entity or the thing in question is unable to talk or communicate in a way that we understand, they're not intelligent. Um, you know, there's a lot of different you know, avenues with that. Would you agree or would you think that? Yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, you know, so as far as, you know, reptiles are concerned, you know, what I like to say is with animals in general is you look at their behaviors and niches as, in my opinion, their different forms of intelligence that, you know, helps them to survive. You know, we said it ourselves, you have to evolve to survive. And, you know, and that is in its own way a specific type of intelligence. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, yes. So absolutely. you know, um, Albert Einstein said something really, really popular. I guess popular, but really notable with what it is that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And you have that. Yeah, I do. So uh, we have it, so that way we don't misquote it. Yeah, misquoting is bad. Yes. Uh, so basically, it the famous quote is: "If you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live live its whole life believing that it's stupid." Um, and I think this really applies well to gauging intelligence in reptiles because up to this point, we've been gauging them or comparing them to human intelligence and even the intelligence of other animals like dogs. Yep. But we can't, in order to understand them, we need to get on their level first. Agreed. And, you know, I think that comes down to looking at their different niches um, behaviors, like I said earlier, um, and you know, there's a lot of different, you know, examples with that. So the first thing that whenever we want to look at an animal, we're always going to be doing our research as far as what is this animal like? Where does it spend its time? What do we eat? How do we hunt? How do we reproduce? All of those different things, all the things that make an animal unique. So, you know, when we are looking at those different things, that's essentially your husbandry, you know, that, that is the first thing you're going to look at. Okay, so how am I going to replicate this as closely as possible so that way they can mimic their natural selves in the terrarium? And, you know, and with that, there comes a lot of different things that you can do that, in my opinion, what loose substrate and bioactive brings mm -hmm. to the table with that. You know, one of the first things that, that always comes to, what always comes to me is my groups of oscillated skinks. So you guys remember that video that I did on the oscillated skinks, the 75-gallon that's right behind me. So I have this big hot dog of a female who's this big. She's been being kept on the Terra Sahara for since this tank has set up. And they have an extensive network of tunnels, burrows throughout the entire, you know, throughout the entire ecosystem in there. But they all share a common den, which is pretty much right in the middle of the terrarium. And every single morning, this hot dog of a female peeks her head out 
and almost does looks like a 360. It's really hard to see exactly what she's doing, but the moment that she emerges, she comes out one by one. Now the rest of them, who's this? Hi, Lucy. <laughs> Hi, Lulu. Yes. Yes, Lucy. It's so good to see you. So they come out one by one by one, but it's always after that big, honestly, hot dog of a female that's in there. And to me, I look at that, and that's like, okay, so she's making sure the coast is clear. And then after the coast is clear, we come out to know that we're safe because there's still wild animals. Like making sure that there's not a bird of prey above us, making sure there's not a snake around us, make sure that we're okay. And I think that's another evolutionary niche that they have to, that they had to do to, to survive. So if you were keeping that oscillated skink on tile or carpet, or eco-worth that doesn't retain tunnels and burrows or a soil that gets really acidic or just in general do you think that those behaviors would be exist that those behaviors would be you know shown to us in the in the terrarium mm -hmm. or do you think that would be something that would be you know impacted behaviors so you get two different kinds of behaviors generally speaking um there are behaviors that are so ingrained in a reptile that it will perform those behaviors even when the environment is not suitable. These are usually basic survival behaviors, um, such as uh, seeking optimal basking sites, um, reproduction, eating, yep. um, things that are absolutely necessary to its survival and not necessarily indicators of thriving. Uh, then you have behaviors that are stimulated by its environment. Okay. So when you present the opportunity, then the reptile re will, in a sense, reward you with exhibiting those wild inspired behaviors. Because yeah. it's kind of like when, it's like the difference between just sitting there in a blank room and going, I came in this room to do something and I can't remember for the life of me what it was versus walking into a room that is set up for you to do that thing that you needed to do, and you go, ah, that's exactly what I need to do, and then you go in and interact with it. Um, that's not an exact analogy of what's going on, but it's more or less the same. It's, they have these instincts that tell them how to interact with a very particular environment and a very particular set of cir circumstances because that's what helped them survive over the course of millennia as yep. their particular species was shaped through evolution. So that's the goal when you're setting up with the enclosure is not just to provide for its basic needs, but also to stimulate its insects and or insects, instincts. And uh, by providing insects, that's an important part for insectivores. There we go, I've tied it back in. Um, and encouraging it to actually be itself. Uh, really important. Don't, don't try to just make it this, this dead thing that you're trying to put on display in an enclosure that has nothing but paper towel and lights. Let's actually yeah. help give it the props that it needs to put on a show for you. You know, you make a really interesting, you know, really interesting statement there. You know, it also kind of makes me think of this. So when you have your old world chameleons, so like your veiled chameleons is a great mm -hmm. example. You know, your females, regardless of what you do, they're going to make eggs, mm -hmm. you know. And when they're a year, a year old, that's when, or a little bit less, that's, you know, right around the time that they're actually going to start. Now, if you do not provide these female chameleons proper egg laying deposition sites, i.e. a lot of substrate, they are going to know that, hey, this ain't going to work. So if you have a rep if you have a chameleon cage with just a potted plant in it with nothing at the bottom but paper towels, and you have mm -hmm. a gravid female veiled chameleon, you know, they are gonna know that this ain't right. They're gonna go down to the bottom of the cage and they're just gonna sit there and they're gonna go up against the plastic and they're just gonna be like this a mm -hmm. lot of times. Because at the end of the day, what what they need to be able to lay their eggs isn't being made available to them. Mm -hmm. So as a byproduct of that, sometimes these girls will hold on to the eggs for as long as they possibly can to the point when they'll overcalcify, mm -hmm. and then they can get egg bound. And once they get egg bound, they, they pretty much die unless you're gonna pay for that surgery to get them taken out. 
-hmm. which I don't haven't met any chameleon keepers that were able to do that. Or you can give them an injection of oxytocin and hope help that solves the problem. Help, help stimulate that out and have them lay. But in, in my opinion, that kind of goes with what you were a little bit kind of with what you were saying. With we have those things that we do to survive that they do to survive versus things that you provide the right environment, here's the reward. Mm -hmm. But here they are in this captive environment, they know if they lay their eggs, it ain't gonna work. Yeah. So why, so why would they set themselves up for failure? And that's, in my opinion, that's kind of survival, that kind of goes into back with just survival of the fittest. They know that it's not gonna be a viable thing, so they're going to retain, they're going to retain until that point is too late. And to me, that's something that makes them really unique. I mean, there are some reptiles that, you know, that that, that can learn. You can give them different conditionings, you know, like Auburn conditioning with different stimuli with food. You know, my box turtle, you know, when I go outside and I see a little stubby, the moment I walk up to his pen, he walks up to me because he knows when I go up there, that he's gonna, that he's getting some food. And I feel like you kind of have that, you can have that too with like your bearded mm -hmm. dragons, your tegus, your your mo uh, monitors, Aki's monitors especially mm -hmm. are very intelligent. Your emerald tree skinks are very, very intelligent with, with, with what it is, with what it is that they do. Yeah. Monitors in general are just incredibly intelligent yeah. and anything, monitors and skinks I would say. Yep. Yep. And, you know, and then, you know, there, there's other there's other examples with that, you know, with, um, for example, when you have a uh, when you have an example of the emerald tree skinks that like to be in groups, like there are mm -hmm. some species of reptiles that like to be in groups. And if you don't provide that setting to them, mm -hmm. they don't thrive. It's like almost as if something is missing from the dynamic that they need and you get different behavioral changes and I don't know it just seems to me like these species they have such there's so many different reptiles with so many specific needs that you know it's, it's just so important that we make sure that when we pick up an animal we buy an animal regardless if it's a leopard gecko or bearded dragon that we always mm -hmm. make sure that we have a full concrete understanding of what can we do to nourish to nourish its natural instincts as much mm -hmm. as possible and then again I just I, I, I feel like instincts and with with intellect, with evolution that comes with that, I feel like that's all tied together with when it comes to animal intelligence. Yeah. Honestly, you know, and then, you know, that kind of leads me, you know, leads us to the next thing, you know, with impaction. You know, I get so many, I don't know about you, but I get so many people like, oh, you, oh dude, you're a con artist selling dirt that's impacting animals. Nah, nah, those people just drive me up the freaking wall because they don't know what they're talking about. They're clueless. But, you know, I think of it this way, Mariah. You know, Australia is a harsh place to freaking live. Like, yeah. it's, it's hot. There's predators everywhere. Everything wants to kill you there. <laughs> and you mean to tell me that there's a lizard that lives in Australia that eats a little bit of sand, that it dies from eating that sand. It wouldn't survive as a species. Mm -hmm. It would have died yeah. out the, the moment it, God or evolution or whatever created it. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, it's, it's, it's to, to, to me, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, also goes with the husbandry that obviously that we we're talking about. So tell me a little about, about your experience with reptophiles, with loose substrate and mm -hmm. the health behind it. Because you mentioned yeah. in our first video, like your viewpoint, I would love for you to elaborate on that because you were so articulate with how that works. I'd love to hear some. All right. So I'll try to explain this to the best of my understanding. Um, so starting with yeah, there are a lot of misconceptions out there about how reptiles interact with their substrate or the ground material of their natural environment. Some people think that uh, they seem to be under the impression that these animals are intentionally ingesting the substrate. Like they see dirt and they have this overwhelming compulsion to swallow mouthfuls of it. Like when beardies do their Thing. Yeah, or more so, like taking mouthfuls of it when they go for uh, for a prey animal. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, use a common example: leopard geckos. I hear a lot of people say, "I don't use loose substrate with my leopard gecko because every time I feed it live insects, it misses and it gets a mouthful of dirt instead, and I'm worried about impaction." Well, here's the deal. A lot of these people who are, have these issues with their leopard geckos, 
One, that leopard gecko may be genetically deficit. It might have a neurological thing going on that is preventing it from hunting effectively. Also, it may be uh, in an early stage of MBD where calcium imbalance is again affecting their ability to move effectively. Then there's also most people feed their reptiles out of bowls, you know, those because they don't want the bugs to get away. So you have these really convenient little dishes where you know you stick the mealworms in, and then it's got a rim, and they can't get, they can't escape. So easy pickings for the leopard gecko. It just sits there and nom nom nom. Or yep. I can't remember if they're mandibular or tongue. It might be a combination I, of I both. Think, I mean, they they have sticky tongues like beardies, but they use their jaws to catch their food. Okay, combination of both. Then, point being, they don't have to chase their food. They just kind of put their mouth there and the food essentially gets in it. So we're not teaching them how to hunt. So when we don't teach them how to hunt, they don't develop the skill. Um, and they have the instinct, but that's not the same as being able to do it well. It's kind of like Makes taking sense. an arboreal species, keeping it in a tub all of its life without the opportunity to climb, and then get it on a branch and it can't climb. And you say, well, then it must not actually be arboreal because if it were truly arboreal, it would be able to climb that branch. Taking a step down from that with ball pythons, peop I, oh, I see this so often. Um, people will say, well, ball pythons aren't arboreal, so don't put branches in their enclosure. Cool. Uh, arboreal and branch and the ability to climb are not mutually, uh, or they're not a package deal. A lot of reptiles, like nature's huge. It's enormous. We're not talking about the scale of even a large terrarium. We're talking about the scale of, you know, ground level and 50 feet above that. And so you've got animals that are living at the 50 foot, and then you've got animals that are living, you know, kind of between zero and 10 feet. Yeah. And there's climbing material there. So with ball pythons, yeah, absolutely terrestrial. Same for other uh, often considered terrestrial species like uh, boa constrictors. So you take them and uh, in the wild, they're climbing trees. They're absolutely climbing trees. There are pictures, lots of anecdotal evidence of them doing this in the wild. And are they arboreal? No. no. But they have the skill. Then in captivity, you put them in an opportunity from the day they hatch, put them in an environment where they can't develop the skill, and then you say, well, oh, well they can't do it. How it is. That must be how it is because they obviously can't do it. Well, sure, I'm going to throw you into a swimming pool without ever teaching you how to swim and then say, well, gee, I guess humans just can't swim. That's a great thing, and that goes back to our animal intelligence. So think of it this way. If you, it's almost as if, like, this is, it's not, it's, it's it learned. So if you have a, a leopard gecko that you hatched, that you got as a, a, a neonate, and you fed it from a cup every single day since it was a baby, mm -hmm. and you had that gecko for five years, and all of a sudden you're like, JK, I'm just going to dump the crickets in here. It would be very challenging mm -hmm. for that lizard to, it would be successful, but not in the aspect that, in my opinion, that you would expect. And, and with what you're saying, again, it's those behaviors, like, it's almost as if improper husbandry can force us, force them for their behaviors to be manipulated, mm -hmm. to go out of their comfort level or out of the way that they are supposed to do it, how yeah. a wild animal is supposed to do it. Yeah, we're keeping them in these in these protective bubbles, essentially. A lot of people express concerns like, well, I just don't want to risk it. I don't want to risk anything. Like with uh, green tree snakes or any other social species, uh, morning geckos in my experience, they're like, well, they could fight. They might hurt each other. So I'm just not going to risk it okay, but you're missing out on an essential part of their behavior and what they are as an animal and what they're supposed to be. And what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to act. It's like keeping a Europlatus gecko mm -hmm. with absolutely no coverage in the tank for them yep. to blend into. Yeah, so that way it they always feel exposed. And it's the same, and then it goes back to that same exact principle mm -hmm. of them being stressed out and not being able to function appropriately. Because mm -hmm. I myself, I've seen lots of pictures of you know, a, a ball python is out, out of their holes in mm -hmm. Africa. Totally, so, yeah. So, so, tons of footage, tons of literature about it. It's there. So let me ask you something. So it's been, like, documented. Like, you have a lot of these 
I hate to call them opinion leaders because they're not accurate opinion leaders, but they, they, well, lead. that's why it's called an opinion. Exactly. I like that. So yeah, so candid. I love it. So <laughs> that's why, so a lot, it's always been reported that they literally pull them out of holes that are two feet into the ground. That's mm -hmm. the only place they find them. Now, do you think that's because of the time of year that they're being collected because that's their more vulnerable time because they're, they're underground because it's that time of year for Africa when I don't want to be out there. Mm. Or is that, or is that just a different type of the behaviors that them as a species mm -hmm. like to rock and roll with? Yeah. Well, they do spend a lot of time in burrows. It's safe. It keeps them safe from predators. They need a place to sleep and they need it to be comfortable. Um, a lot of the burrows that you see footage of actually, like, you know, the, the red dirt mm -hmm. and, you know, you got this hole in the ground. So one, the ball python didn't make that hole. It moved into a hole that another animal made. And two, that's farmland. That's not their actual natural environment. That is an, a borderline artificial environment, an adaptation that they have developed to, uh, in response to dealing with living with humans in close proximity. So we're talking a survive. lot of open space. That's farmland, no trees. We've got, you know, one type of plant and then a bunch of weeds. Um, it's flat. It's yeah. exposed. Yep. Of course, they're going to be in burrows. That's the only place where that, they feel secure. That, that makes perfect sense. That makes so. So let me ask you something. So we know that in, in our my personal opinion, so loose substrate is always going to be always going to be the way to go. Yes, let's bring it back. Uh, you know. Oh no, no, you didn't, <laughs> uh, didn't didn't digress at all. But what I want to talk about is when isn't loose substrate appropriate? Okay. You know, yes. because there are times, guys, when. I'm going to tell, I've had customers come to me a lot of times that they just got a beardy from a rescue. This beardy has, has pinworms, has MBD, mm -hmm. or a whole mess of nonsense from people not providing UVB, improper supplementation, or just, just bad overall husbandry. Mm -hmm. So, so let, let's talk about that. When isn't it okay to use, because we know that it's an immunocompromised animal, mm -hmm. no bueno. So you've already led right into it. It's when the animal isn't healthy, whether that's because it is ill or because like I mentioned earlier, it's got something wrong with its genetics. So if we as humans have done a poor job breeding the animal, oh boy, that's gonna get flack. Um, <laughs> and we have bred for appearance rather than its ability to, uh, to live the way that it was initially designed to live, then we start to see a digression from uh, from keeping it in a naturalistic way and keeping it in an artificial way. Are we breeding them to be artificial or are we breeding them to be natural? Are we are true to themselves? So tackling the genetic side first, um, there are known morphs uh, like uh, the uh, Enigma syndrome in leopard geckos and uh, the spider ball pythons that have actually been, both of those genes have been banned from being uh, perpetuated through breeding in some countries. I want to say Germany is tell, one of them, but I'm not me, sure. Tell me about the, I never heard of this Enigma gene. I, I, I really? know. Really? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about it. I've, I've never heard of that before. So I'm not a breeder, but my understanding is that Enigma is a kill gene. But it's uh, a tricky one because it doesn't have, it's not like if the gene is present, animal dies. It's one of those cases where if two Enigma genes are present, it will die. So you don't breed an Enigma gecko to an Enigma gecko. Um, but if you breed an Enigma gecko to a normal gecko, then you get baby geckos that might have Enigma syndrome and with it, a host of neurological issues. Something like that happened to me, uh, not to me, uh, mm -hmm. when I was in Pennsylvania in 2010, I bought my wife some black red-eye tree frogs, captive bred ones. Mm -hmm. These things were freaking expensive. They were beautiful frogs. However, I was not told that they cannot be exposed to any type of light. Uh. Because supposedly that the, the coloration of their skin can cause, with a lot of sunlight, not necessarily UVB, but just plant lights, like mimicking the sun spectrum without UVB, mm -hmm. that can cause, can cause damage to them. So right here, we got this group of three 
Mm -hmm. Literally, after going through three months of quarantine in a normal, sterile, you know, environment, after being mm -hmm. tested for chytrid, rana, being wormed, I put them in this beautiful vivarium, vivarium that we built in under a week. We mm -hmm. lost them all. Oh. And we did, uh, you know, I sent the one out to a necropsy. They couldn't tell me anything until mm. I finally reached out to the breeder and an individual told me, oh, yeah, you don't want to give them a lot of bright light because they can be reactive to it. And supposedly that's also a thing with, with, with the, the bubble gum, gene, huh. like the pink red eyes. Really? I, I don't know if that is similar to the albinism gene when you have albinos that if there's a lot of Possible. UVB that they could potentially be more um, sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. or, is that or is that just like, like false? Because you know a lot more about, about UVB than I do. Well, I don't know about bubble gum eyes, but Yes, when you have albinism, you have an increased sensitivity to UVB as well as light. Or I should say UV, because UVA and UVB are both damaging, um, okay. potentially. I really hate getting into the damaging effects of UVB because everyone's like, ah, sunburn! And it's like, eh, It'll blind my leopard gecko. Yeah, it just devolves from there. So, <laughs> absolutely, yes. Um, with albino reptiles, you do have to take very... Uh, specific steps to uh, make sure that you are not going to harm it um, or anything that is actually less pigmented than the wild type.